morning and good afternoon to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this uh, webinar sponsored by the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. Since the pandemic hit, this is about the 75th webinar that we've had directly related to Ukraine. We have covered about every subject, but as you know, from week to week, the main subjects or some of the subjects are the situation gets more complex. My name is Morgan Williams. I serve as president and chief executive officer of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council. We appreciate all those that have joined us, and we know we have some new persons that have joined us. The council was started in 1995 in Washington, D.C., and so now for 28 years, We've been uh, promoting Ukraine as a place to do business. We've been trying to make it an easier, better place to business. We've been promoting the interests of our members with the Ukraine government and with the U.S. government. And working on Ukraine for 28 years, it's probably somewhat equal to what our speaker for today has been working on Ukraine specifically, I think, uh, at least 28 years or more. Uh, since Ukraine uh, became an independent country. Most all of you, I'm sure, listening have an idea about what's been going on and uh, the difficulties that we face. And, of course, the difficulties we face uh, continue. And so many people thought the war would be over quickly. Well, Ukraine has approved that that's not the case, and they continue to defend themselves in amazing ways. We're very pleased to have David Kramer with us today as our featured presenter and uh, answering all of our tough questions uh, that we will throw at him. David has been involved, as I said, with Ukraine for a long time. He uh, has been at the State Department. He's uh, been in academic work. He's now the uh, executive director of the George Bush Institute in Dallas, Texas. So we're very pleased to have David. He's one of the leading analysts, leading commentators, leading writers of op-eds for major papers on issues. And what we like about David is he's pretty upfront. He calls a spade a spade, and he gives us the reality of what's going on. So now, then I... Before I introduce David, I introduce Nadia Komazuk from our, my colleague in Washington. She puts these together, and she'll be watching the, the chat line and the Q&A line. So fill out the Q&A line and fill out the chat line. We'll be taking a look at those for some questions uh, for David. So once again, David's been a longtime friend of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council. He serves as a senior advisor. He's been on many of our programs. And so, David, we're very pleased to have you with us again. And we'll turn the program over to you. And then we'll have some questions. And then we'll go to those who are watching online. Thank you very much, David. Morgan, thank you. And thanks to Nadia for putting this together. And it's Great to be back with your incredibly important group, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. Um, as you said, I've been uh, a fan and supporter of it for, for many, many years and have been following what you do with uh, great admiration and support. So thank you for this opportunity. And, and it's a privilege for me to be joining all of you uh, in Ukraine, in the United States and anywhere else. As all of you know, this has uh, been a very uh, trying week uh, after the horrific Hamas terrorist attack on Israel uh, starting on Saturday. And we have seen reports of uh, killing of innocent civilians, the beheading of babies, uh, raping of women and then killing them. Um, these are, are horrific stories and scenes and videos that we are witness to. Uh, sadly, this is not new to our Ukrainian audience. Uh, Ukrainians have been experiencing similar horrific crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, even genocide being committed against them by Putin and his forces. 
Israel has been attacked by a terrorist organization, Hamas. Russia, uh, Ukraine has been attacked by a, a terrorist state uh, in the Putin regime. And so there are unfortunate similarities between what both Ukraine and Israel have been experiencing. And it is a reminder that an attack on freedom and democracy anywhere is an attack on freedom and democracy everywhere. And particularly when it comes to friends and allies like Ukraine and Israel, we in the United States and in the rest of Europe have a responsibility to do what we can to help both. And we don't have a choice here. We've heard some political figures in the United States argue that we need to shift our assistance for Ukraine and send it to Israel. We've heard other commentators say that supporting Ukraine takes our focus off the ball with China, that that's where our focus should be. I, I think all of these arguments are completely off base. We do need to support Israel without doubt. And President Biden has taken a very strong and unambiguous stance on that. We do need to help Taiwan prepare for any possibility of Chinese aggression against that island state. But we also have an obligation and an, a, a vast national security interest in supporting Ukraine and helping Ukraine not just defend itself, but to win this war that Putin started, not just February of last year, but going back to 2014, when Russia illegally annexed Crimea and then moved into the Donbass. It is important, and this audience knows this very well, of course, that that war that was started in 2014 was not just some territorial dispute. It wasn't just some uh, frozen conflict. That war cost more than 14,000 Ukrainian lives between 2014 and February 24th of 2022. Now, of course, the toll has increased significantly since Russia's full-scale invasion against Ukraine starting last year. But it is a reminder that supporting Ukraine is in U.S. national interest. It is in the interest of other European states. And I try consciously to use the term other European states or other parts of Europe because very clearly Ukraine is part of Europe. And so it is in the interest of, of our countries to support and help Ukraine. It's also the moral and right thing to do. And we should never forget, by the way, that in the last century, two world wars originated on the European continent. And this is the worst war, the worst military conflict on the European continent since the end of the last world war, going back some uh, nearly 80 years. And so it is the right thing to do to support Ukraine. And we have to remember that Ukraine is the front line of freedom. Had Ukraine not put up such a heroic and brave and courageous defense and resistance against Russian aggression, we would be talking about an even worse situation for the United States because NATO allies that are along the border with Ukraine would be in grave danger if not already under attack. Putin, were he to succeed in Ukraine, would then test his luck against NATO because he would interpret a success in Ukraine as a failure on NATO's part, as weakness on the part of the West. And so it is incredibly important to support Ukraine, not only to help Ukrainians, but also to protect our NATO allies and our other interests in Europe. And we have seen some arguments saying that Russia's capabilities are limited. There's no question that the Russian military has been handicapped by massive corruption, poor leadership, terrible decision-making, lousy generals. But the reason the Russians have not succeeded in Ukraine is because of the Ukrainians because of the heroism of the Ukrainian people, the leadership of President Zelensky, and the support of the international community. And that needs to continue. We cannot let up. We, we in the United States and in the rest of Europe cannot engage in the Ukraine fatigue that we sometimes hear about. We have to remember that there's no one who wants this war to end sooner than Ukrainians. They're the ones who are dying and suffering tragically every single day. They aren't asking us in the United States or in the rest of Europe to send our troops to fight this fight for them. 
They are the ones doing the fighting. What they are asking for is our assistance, military assistance, economic assistance, political assistance. And it seems to me that that is the least we can do. As I think your, your audience knows, Morgan, the, the United States has provided uh, roughly $43 billion in military assistance to Ukraine. Spread out over a year and a half, that is less than 5% of U.S. defense spending. And what has happened with that assistance and the assistance from other countries is that the Ukrainians have inflicted tremendous damage on the Russian military. They are delivering a victory, not just for themselves, but for us, by weakening Russia's conventional military capabilities to a significant degree. And so it is even a good investment, you could say, to help weaken and cripple Putin's efforts to go after not just Ukraine, but other countries in the region. It's also important to help Ukraine because China is watching what we're doing. Again, for those who argue Ukraine is a distraction from where our focus should be, they have it completely backwards. Among Ukraine's strongest supporters are people in Taiwan. The Taiwanese recognize that how the United States and our allies respond and help and support Ukraine will have huge implications for their own future, their own security. And so it is incredibly important that we make it clear that Russia, by invading Ukraine, is paying a huge price. Similarly, the Chinese leadership hopefully will infer from that that they too would pay a huge price should they move against Taiwan. And so what we do with Ukraine, in Ukraine, for Ukraine, has enormous implications well beyond Ukraine. If we don't help Ukraine, we will be back into a global food security crisis where Russia has blockaded Ukrainian exports coming out of the Black Sea. We will experience an energy crisis that will be on a global scale. The stakes here are enormous, and the United States needs to maintain its support for Ukraine. Again, I don't particularly like the administration's phrase of as long as it takes. I would prefer the administration to say until Ukraine wins. And let me define what I mean by Ukrainian victory. Because it's consistent, I think, with the position, not just of President Zelensky, but the vast majority of Ukrainians. And that is victory means driving every Russian occupying and invading force off of Ukrainian territory. And it's regrettable that we have to add this phrase, but sometimes we do. That includes Crimea. Poll after poll show that Ukrainians do not support territorial concessions or compromises that would consign millions of Ukrainians to repressive Russian control. They don't support and trust any agreement with Putin. And there's good reason for that, because Putin doesn't live up to his word on any agreement he signed, whether arms control, human rights, or or, uh, the Minsk agreements of 2014, 2015. And so it's incredibly important that we respect the views of the Ukrainian people, recognize their agency in this process, and reject any efforts from outside forces who want to try to impose any compromise, armistice, or any other kind of end to this war. As Secretary Blinken said just the other day, this war could end if Putin withdrew his forces. There are other things that would need to follow from that accountability for the war crimes that Russia has committed. And then taking not just freezing, but seizing the Russian assets in parts of Europe and the United States, Japan and elsewhere, that would help compensate the terrible damage that Russia has caused in Ukraine. And there already do seem to be indications that Western nations are moving in this direction. A report in the Washington Post yesterday suggesting that the administration is moving in a more serious direction in this way. This should have happened months ago. And we've seen now some tax revenue from the frozen assets being turned over to the Ukrainians to help fund reconstruction. And so there there are things that need to follow that would include accountability for war crimes, 
in Russian reparations for the damage that has been done. It is unconscionable to me to imagine that the Europeans and the United States and others would return these frozen funds to Russia after what Russia has done to Ukraine. And so I think there are many steps that we can take that would reduce the burden on our uh, country's coffers and also that of the Europeans to make sure that the Russians pay for what they have done. Europe has also stepped up. It's important to understand. You hear in the United States that the burden shouldn't just be on the United States. Well, that's true because the burden is not just on the United States. Our European allies have stepped up and in fact, in total have provided more assistance. Some nations have provided a larger percentage of their GDP in support of Ukraine. So there has been, I think, impressive support coming from our European allies to help Ukraine militarily, but even more so economically. And that is how it should be. We should not be doing this alone. And the reality is we aren't doing this alone. Um, we, I think, need to maintain and tighten the sanctions that the administration put in place at the beginning of this uh, full-scale invasion. And I give credit to the administration for maintaining unity among allies with sanctions and the regime on sanctions. I give them credit for these meetings that are held in Germany to rally military assistance for Ukraine. We see a number of allies, in addition to our own country, stepping up and providing such critical life-saving support. It's, we, we hear now frustration that the counteroffensive of Ukraine has been moving too slowly. President, uh, rather, Secretary Biden, just uh, yesterday, I think it was, in announcing additional U.S. military assistance, had a, a key sentence in his announcement that I want to read. And, and it says, in the past year, Ukraine's forces have taken back more than 50% of the territory seized by Russia's forces since February of 2022. More than 50% of the territory seized by Russia has been retaken by Ukraine. We're talking about roughly 18% of Ukrainian territory remaining occupied by Russian forces. There was roughly 7 to 8% of Ukrainian territory occupied by Russian forces before the full-scale invasion last year. So Ukraine has made enormous progress. We should not be shocked that this remaining percentage, and it's an important percentage, I don't want to consign it to a Russian, Russian control. This remaining percentage is going to be the most difficult to regain control over. But the other difference is that Ukraine is doing this without the air support that any NATO country would insist upon before launching such a counteroffensive. And moreover, President Zelensky is a democratically elected president of his country, which means he is accountable to the citizens of Ukraine. He has to care about, and he does, and account for every Ukrainian who's sent into harm's way. Putin doesn't have that concern or restraint, but Zelensky does, and he needs to make sure that he can harness as much Ukrainian strength through manpower and equipment as possible and not engage in any reckless moves that would put all of that in, in grave danger. So it is important to recognize that this counteroffensive is difficult. If it were easy, it would have been over months ago, but it is difficult. And again, we cannot suffer from Ukraine fatigue since we're not the ones on the front line doing the fighting and tragically the dying. Ukraine is a country that over the course of a decade experienced two democratic pro-Western revolutions in 2004 and in 2013 and 14. I can't think of another country that has demonstrated the second time with the loss of more than 100 peaceful demonstrators, its support for democracy, for an end to corruption, for a Western Euro-Atlantic orientation. And it is, uh, I think, safe to say that for that and for what Ukrainians are fighting for today, the least we can do is to provide our support. And so uh, let me close, Morgan, by saying 
I know there's a lot of consternation, understandably so, with the future assistance decisions that are waiting for Congress. It, it seems to me that this should be a top priority. And I'm not going to get into the various mechanisms and, and ways to do this, whether it's attached to support for Israel or not, but I would just make the broad case that continuing to support Ukraine serves U.S. national interests, and it is the right moral thing to do to help Ukraine win. The stakes here could not be bigger, and we need to think about the repercussions of a Ukrainian victory and a Russian defeat. We seem sometimes to be handicapping ourselves, worrying about what a Russian defeat might be in negative terms. But think about what a Russian defeat might mean in a positive sense. I think that would mean the end for Alexander Lukashenko, the dictator in Belarus. It would free up Moldova, which has always worried about the Russian Damocles hanging over them. It would allow the people in the neighboring states to sleep a little better at night particularly those who don't have Article 5 security guarantees as NATO member states. And so a Russian defeat, I think, would be a, a most desirable outcome. I'm not worried uh, about sparing Putin of humiliation, as some argue. This is his problem. He created it. And let the chips fall where they may after a Russian defeat. I'm, I'm not one to predict that Putin would necessarily fall after a Russian defeat in Ukraine, nor do I predict a Russian collapse, that the state would break up into various uh, segments. But I do think we sometimes look too much at the negative and not at the positive. And of course, a Russian defeat would also mean a Ukrainian victory. And no one has earned that more than the people of Ukraine. So Morgan, let me stop there and happy to uh, take any questions from you or from the audience, but thanks very much. David, thank you very much. Uh, you outlined it uh, uh, very perfectly. You outlined it very, very strongly. Uh, we need to get that message across on a continuing basis to the people of, you, of the United States and to our Congress and on uh, the White House. And I get a little concerned about the news media every... And every other day you pick up an article that says, are the people of the United States supporting Ukraine enough? Uh, is there enough of support? And then people start thinking, is there enough support? And I think they've overplayed the uh, the support percentage from Capitol Hill and also from the American people. We think it's very strong, but the news media keeps analyzing and say, is it really there? Uh, let's go back to Hamas. Another major upheaval that we didn't need, that Ukraine didn't need. There's some people that are saying this was uh, designed by a long time, for a long time, by experts, including Iran, and that Hamas would have never made this decision without critical support from Iran and probably support from Putin to attack Iran, but also divert attention from the United States and to weaken support for Ukraine. So do you think uh, behind all this uh, was part of it was uh, a way to uh, reduce support for Ukraine? The, the, that Russia was involved or behind the Hamas attack, you mean? Well, I, I think, Morgan, look, I, I don't know that there's any evidence pointing to a Russian connection um, with this latest terrorist attack by Hamas. But Russia does not recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization. Uh, Hamas officials visited Moscow in 2020, and there are constant communications between Russian officials and Hamas officials. Um, the, the, the Iranian connection here is, is obvious as well. And, and so I think we are seeing a situation that Russian officials, whether they had any connection or not, um, may think they can benefit from this, that this will distract the world's attention from what Russia is doing in Ukraine, that it will divert resources that were intended for Ukraine and have them sent to Israel. 
Um, and so I, I'm sure that the Russian officials are are trying to calculate how to spin this in their, uh, to their benefit. As far as I know, uh, so far, Russia has not condemned the attack. It has not expressed its outrage over the terrorist attack, um, in part because, as I said at the outset, Russia has been doing this itself. And by the way, it isn't just Russia's war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. Russia has been accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria, uh, where Russian uh, aircraft have bombed civilian targets in Syria in support of that butcher Assad, where Wagner forces have engaged in brutal uh, tactics against uh, people in the Central African Republic and Mali and Libya and elsewhere. Um, one reason why Putin and the Kremlin may not be condemning what Hamas da, did is because they do it themselves on a fairly regular basis. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, let me just add that Putin has been trying to nurture a closer, better relationship with Israel over the years. Um, and that is something that I think he does not want to endanger by signaling too much support for Hamas. So, uh, but but if nothing else, I think Russian officials uh, welcome a, a distraction um, and their failure to condemn the attack, however, is something that should not go unnoticed. Uh, David, what do you think about the EU? They've, uh, they have some of their own problems of, of keeping solidarity for Ukraine. You've got uh, some of the things that Turkey does. You've got uh, Hungary. You've got uh, Slovak elections. That leaders that are pro Russian are getting elected now. Uh, so, trying to keep everybody together and keep the EU strong seems to be uh, not a given and, and, a, and a problem. So, how do you see some of these uh, upheavals and disruptions in support for Ukraine out of the out of the EU? The unity among Europeans has has stood up much better than I think most observers, including me, uh, anticipated from the outset. And we have seen numerous rounds of sanctions by the Europeans uh, imposed, and we have seen significant assistance coming from the Europeans. And, and to be clear, it isn't just EU members. Uh, it includes the UK and Norway as well that have provided uh, vital assistance to Ukraine. Um, so I, I do think that the assistance uh, will continue. Uh, the, the pledges that have been made just this week in Germany are a further indication of that. But you're right to point to some causes of concern, uh, whether it's Orban in Hungary um, or, or now the elections in Slovakia, uh, where Fico has said that he does not support um, uh, uh, d does not support providing assistance to Ukraine and imposing sanctions on Russia. Turkey has has a more complicated role, I would argue, Morgan. I mean, their drones provided to the Ukrainians early in the conflict were absolutely vital uh, to help Ukraine fend off the Russian invading forces. And uh, Erdogan has played a key role in trying to negotiate resumption of the uh, Black Sea deal that allowed Ukrainian exports, but he also meets with Putin on a regular basis. And uh, so Turkey is a complicated player in this process. But um, I, I think the Europeans, for the most part, have held together stronger than we anticipated. And what they are now worried about is us in the United States with the situation in the House of Representatives and questions about where we may be if this war continues uh, well into next year. Okay, it's another issue. Uh, it's amazing how many major issues the leadership of Ukraine has had to face since this stole, since this war started. And of course, this last week has brought up another one that they have to uh, to deal with. I'd like to say that the business community has stayed very strong on Ukraine. We've been very proud of the business community. Ukraine needs the business community. Uh, in those revolutions you talked about, 
most of our major members did not leave. They didn't leave in the Orange Revolution. They didn't leave in the Revolution of Dignity. And they haven't left now. We're just very proud that they've stayed in Ukraine. They kept their people employed. They provided assistance to their employees. They've created new jobs. They've moved to the safer areas. And they have plans for the future. So those business people that we talk to, they don't support this thing as long as it takes. They say it's time to get this thing over with. It's time to get back to business. It's uh, Let's not let it drag on. The United States says we want to help rebuild Ukraine. But why continue to let Ukraine be destroyed if you want to help rebuild it? Stop the war now. You don't have to rebuild so much. And uh, we'd like to say that it's... Uh, there was one figure on Capitol Hill the other day that called assistance to Ukraine. He called it welfare. He called it just like passing out welfare. I don't know where he grew up. I don't know who his teachers were. I don't know where he got his political philosophy. But I think you would agree helping Ukraine is, is uh, defend freedom is not welfare. Helping Europe defeat uh, Mr. Putin and helping us defend the pit is not welfare. How do you call what we're doing in Ukraine? How do you call it welfare? So Morgan, I think there are two pieces here. Um, one is it's important for supporters of Ukraine to ensure that that support remains firm. I, I think you will have some people spout off nonsense and I think trying to persuade them otherwise is pointless and, and not a good use of time. Uh, I, I think um, rallying those who are in support and making sure they stay on the pro-Ukraine side is the best way to approach this. Um, I, I think for, I don't know who this member was, but um, it, it's not the only comments we've heard like that. Um, you, you hear that um, uh, some argue we should be protecting our own border, not the Ukrainian border. We're the greatest nation on earth, and the United States can do both. We can secure our border, but we also have to provide assistance to Ukraine. Imagine if we didn't provide assistance to Ukraine. Would we continue to see the unity that you and I just talked about among the Europeans? Would we see the Europeans come to Taiwan support after President Xi concluded that if we pulled out of Ukraine, well, then he has free reign on Taiwan. If we were to withdraw our leadership role, then the world would be in much worse shape than it is. And it's already in some uh, difficult times right now. Um, so I, I, I tend to keep those kinds of comments in mind, but not get too focused on them because I still think they are a might reflect a minority of views in the Hill rather than the majority. I think there is a strong majority, particularly in the Senate, but even in the House, in support of Ukraine and making sure that core of support stays intact is important. But then the the beginning where you started, Morgan, about people wanting this war to end. As I said in my opening comments, nobody wants this war to end sooner than Ukrainians. But they want it to end in a way that this never happens again. They don't want to consign their fellow citizens to Russian repression, to Russian control. If the war were to end now, Russia would occupy roughly 18% of Ukrainian territory. I don't think that would provide for Ukraine's security in the future. And it certainly would basically write off millions of Ukrainians who would not be given a choice whether to live under Russian control or be allowed to return to Ukraine. It's important to remember that, and I cited this uh, for another webinar last week, that in 1991, over 92% of Ukrainians voted in a, in a December referendum for independence. And over 54% of Crimeans, people living in Crimea, voted for independence. People living in these territories want to live under Ukrainian rule, under Ukrainian leadership. Um, and they may not like what's happening in Kyiv, 
Um, but as far as I know, that referendum that was conducted in 2014 was about as phony as you could have. And it did not reflect the will of the people. And what has happened to people living in Crimea, they have, particularly Crimean Tartars, have been subjected to terrible brutality and treatment by the Russian uh, control authorities. And the same happens in Donetsk and Luhansk and elsewhere. And so it is important that as long as the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians are the ones who should decide this, are determined to fight to liberate all of their territory, then we should support them. Otherwise, we would be engaging in uh, helping Putin achieve his goals. And I don't think that's what anyone should want. Well, there are people that keep asking, why do we keep uh, having webinars and talking about why we should be supporting Ukraine and why we should be defeating Mr. Putin? It seems obvious to us and it seems very logical. But sometimes when you hear people in Washington talk, you wonder, where did they come from? Uh, you know, what planet did they arrive from? How did they, could they draw such uh, what we think is an illogical, completely uh, false? And we want the main thing is continue to tell uh, the White House and uh, our friends in Congress and American people, they're only in a small minority, but they've got quite a bit of power. Even they're in a small minority, as you can see when what happened in the speaker race. So uh, we have to just continue to tell the story and tell the story and tell the story because these guys get a lot of publicity and, and it's just, some, I mean, I'm just always in shock when I hear some of them talk that they have no concept of history, no concept of the battle for freedom, no concept of the battle for liberty for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and, and why, the, you know, Ukraine is... Uh, the centerpiece right now and nobody wants to just say uh as long as it takes as long as it takes you're absolutely right i hear hundreds of people say that as long as it takes is not what we want to hear from the the u.s government let's you know, go to um, you and then the nadia can be ready with some questions but let me, uh, let me if i can just yeah. say on, on your what you were just saying um, the White House indicated late last week that President Biden finally was going to give a speech to the American people explaining why U.S. support for Ukraine was so important. Uh, this is something you and I and many others have been calling for for months and months and months. President Biden has given good speeches in Warsaw and Helsinki uh, explaining why U.S. support uh, is, is important for Ukraine. He has not given such a speech to the American people. And I think that has been a, a real oversight on the part of the administration. He instead, by not explaining to the American people, has ceded the field to the naysayers, to the uh, conspiracy theorists and others out there who say U.S. support for Ukraine is not in, in U.S. national interest. I, I dare say, we're, and now I don't know if he will give such a, a speech in light of what happened in Israel, but if he were to give such a speech, I bet you Mitch McConnell and Mike McCall and uh, uh, Lindsey Graham and others would go out there and say, we disagree with Joe Biden on pretty much everything except when it comes to support for Ukraine. And I think a speech by the president of the United States in prime time explaining to the American people why support for Ukraine is so important. It is late in the game to do so but I don't think it's too late and I wish he would do so. And then I think you would see a rallying around uh, by key Republicans. Um, the House situation is obviously a, a bit of a mess, um, but I, I hope that once the speaker situation is sorted out, that we will see uh, members of the House, Republicans and Democrats, come out in support of assistance to Ukraine because it is in U.S. national interest. Well, I think we ought to, do some more work and after World War II, point out how much the United States government is supporting Korea, how much we've supported Israel, how much we've supported Taiwan and many, many other countries around the world. And when you add that all up, what we're doing for Ukraine is not that big, not that big. Just talk about what we give Israel this year, uh, every year and Taiwan and Korea and lots of other countries to support freedom the very thing that we're doing here 
And so people get it all out of uh, uh, context. They get it all out of uh, uh, the frame of the support for, that the United States gives to many, many countries around the world to support freedom. Ukraine lately has been talking about expanding their own defense sector, which they know they need to do. They called a big meeting in, in Kiev lately, brought in a lot of U.S. defense companies. We have over 30 U U.S. defense companies as new members this year. They're really getting engaged. They want a footprint in Ukraine. They want to manufacture something there. They want to get things repaired there. They want to support Ukraine. And uh, let's hear some comments from you. It takes. It's going to take a while. It's going to take some changes on the behalf of the Ukraine government in terms of uh, rule of law, corruption, uh, all kinds of bureaucratic laws about imports. And, and then used to say everything we have in Ukraine, uh, 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 everything we have in Ukraine is top secret. We can't share it with anyone. Uh, so what are we going to be talking about in terms of uh, helping Ukraine increase its ability to, uh, to build advanced military equipment? Well, it, 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 it's part of, it, we, we need to shift our, our goals because it seems to me that the goals right now of the administration are to give Ukraine enough to just make a, a difference. Um, we need to change that so that our goal is explicitly to help Ukraine win and regain control over its territory as long as Ukrainians are prepared to fight and do so. And um, I, I remember back in February, comments by top administration officials saying, uh, Ukrainians don't need attack right now. Well, first of all, I disagree with that. But secondly, um, even if they didn't need them then, we should have known they would need them down the road. And by the time decisions are made, it takes time to get these weapon systems to them, to train them on how to use them. Although I think we all can agree, Ukrainians have shown just a tremendous adaptive skills on new weapon systems. And, and so th there has been there has been a frustrating pattern where Ukrainians ask for a specific weapon system. We say no. They ask again. We say maybe. They ask again and we say yes, finally. But in that intervening period, the administration needs to understand Ukrainians are getting killed. They're getting killed in, the, clearly. Let me put the uh, be very clear about this. The responsibility for Ukrainian deaths lies with Putin and Russian forces. But our delay, our dithering, is also costly in terms of Ukrainian lives. And so we need a, an expedited decision-making process on the weapons that the Ukrainians say they need. Um, and it has been a frustrating experience in that respect. So I, I think pressure from uh, your community, the, the business council and others, uh, your listeners, um, calling up members of Congress, uh, calling up the White House, urging them to move this forward. Again, it's it, the past five days have complicated this, unfortunately, for the situation uh, in, in Ukraine. But I think I saw a comment uh, someone posted. These are related because these are evil sources, whether it's the terrorist organization Hamas or the Putin regime in Moscow. And again, I come back to what I said earlier. Think about the positives of what a Russian defeat in Ukraine would mean, because Russia would be in a weaker position to provide support to Hamas. Russia would be in a weaker position to provide support to Iran. It would be in a weaker position to provide support to Assad in Syria. And so you could see, I don't want to get carried away with this, you could see a kind of domino effect where Ukrainian victory and Russian defeat would have huge spillover repercussions elsewhere around the world and lead to the demise of other evil forces that, that we see acting out. So the stakes are enormous. We need to give Ukraine what they need, just as we need to make sure Israel has what it needs, uh, as President Biden has said, in order to defeat the Hamas threat. Yes, and we also want to man mention uh, the great humanitarian needs in Ukraine during this war and after all the efforts to rebuild. Lots of meetings about building Ukraine, moving it forward, lots of 
concerns about humanitarian needs. And I want to say that the business community has been up front, uh, standing in line, giving money for humanitarian purposes, creating their own humanitarian work, protecting their people and creating jobs. You got to have jobs for people. You got to have income. You got to be able to build and keep the economy going. And so the humanitarian work done by the United States humanitarian companies, but a lot of that is financed by business, financed by the business community who've given hundreds of millions of dollars to support the humanitarian. And uh, they're already working on building houses. They're already working on building infrastructure. They're not a sitting back until the war is over. They know that the war risk has to reduce for huge, huge investments. But, but in spite of everything, the humanitarian assistance is another major uh, success story for Ukraine. And we just have people called all the time, what can I do to help Ukraine? Some of them are saying, we're going to invest in Ukraine as soon as we can. We want to support the country. Besides, we want a broad base where we source things. A lot of people are saying we'd like to source more in Ukraine and source less in uh, China and other places. So being a part of the supply chain, but we need to give accolades to the private business community. It's just amazing what they've done over there and thousands of people that they have working for them that are involved in that and also the hundreds of millions they've given to uh, humanitarian groups. It's uh, something we can't forget and it's also very critical to the success of Ukraine uh, to deal with these uh, huge humanitarian issues that, that Putin has caused. Agreed. Uh, Nadia, have you selected some questions for David? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, we have a question uh, from our defense member, RTX, formerly uh, Raytheon, so far the largest defense company in the world. Uh, Neta Lomasny is asking, thank you, David, for your comments. Do you see a shift coming transitioning from primarily U.S. government funded support through USAI to Ukraine self-funding or other foreign military finance funding to continue to procure supply um, additional defense capabilities as they need to restock. Um, I, well, I, I think I think the funding needs to come from a multitude of sources, um, and it needs to come from the international community. Um, it needs to come from the private sector. It needs to come from others who are able to contribute to Ukraine. Um, Ukraine's resources are very limited, um, and and so I think we have to be reasonable in expecting the Ukrainians to fund uh, some of the, some of the uh, military equipment that they need. Um, this is what they're asking for. The, the Ukrainians are asking for military assistance from the international community. And uh, let's also uh, be realistic about this. A lot of the funding that is appropriated for military assistance to Ukraine stays in the United States. It goes to our companies to produce these weapon systems that we're then able to send and provide to Ukraine. So I, I don't want to look at this from a, a mercantilist uh, perspective, but um, this does generate jobs and, and, and work for Americans. Um, it's tragic that it has to come from such a situation and such a need. Um, but uh, Americans need to understand that it comes back, Morgan, to what you were quoting a, a member saying that we're providing welfare to Ukraine, which is absolute drivel and nonsense. Um, we are providing life-saving support to Ukraine, both militarily and economically, and we're also supporting our own industries here in the United States. And so it seems to me that this is uh, not just a, a smart investment economically, um, it, it is vital militarily, and um, it addresses a, a concern that I think many have voiced that we have neglected some of these weapon systems over the years and need to make sure that we have them at the ready. I think there was important, I don't want to diminish this too much, but too much thinking about the wars of the future, and that is incredibly important to do. And not enough appreciation that the wars of the past are still with us here in the present. Um, and the, the barbaric tactics 
that Hamas uses are similar to the barbaric tactics, frankly, that uh, Russian forces have used in Bucha and Mariupol and, and tragically many other places. So I, I think um, it, it is important to continue to provide the ammunition and other weapon systems that we have used in the past and that are needed now, while at the same time thinking about what we might need in the future. I, I am not sure that's a great answer to the question, but but I appreciate her 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 uh, comment. Thank you. We have a question from another senior advisor, Oris Dechakivsky. Thanks, David. How would you assess Putin's uh, vulnerability at this point of time, Orest? Well, Orest, thanks so much for, for your question. It, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think we have, on the one hand, we have had tremendous insight into Russian thinking in the lead up to the war, where we were had very solid intelligence that showed the Russians were going to invade no matter what we did. Um, and, and so we were able to put that intelligence out. That obviously reflected that we had good sourcing inside Russia. I think that has kind of clammed up or closed up, if you will. Um, and so our insights into uh, Putin's standing these days are much more difficult to come by. We're kind of back to the old Kremlinology days, looking at where Putin's standing, whom he's meeting with, and so on. Um, I, I guess I would answer your question this way, Oris. There, there's a tendency among some, not you, of course, but a tendency among some others um, who worry about what might come after Putin. And I think people spend way too much time. I worry about what we're experiencing right now with Putin in power. The Putin right now is an existential threat, frankly, to his own people, to Ukrainians, to Georgians, Moldovans, Syrians, the list goes on and on to us. You've got the idiot Dmitry Medvedev spouting off about use of nuclear weapons every other day. And, and so let's recognize that what's in power right now in Russia is a grave threat. And what comes after Putin, frankly, is not going to be up to us. It's going to be up to the Russian people or a circle around Putin, um, and they will decide what comes after. I, I think there is a possibility, I'm not going to predict this, a possibility that what comes after Putin will recognize that Putin has put Russia in an absolutely horrible position. It is He has weakened Russia's national interests. He has destroyed Russia's reputation and standing. Just this week, Russia tried to uh, return to the UN Human Rights Council in a secret ballot, and it got beaten out by Bulgaria and Albania. Russia only got 83 votes in a secret ballot. So so all the talk about, I'm getting off your question, Oris, I apologize, but all the talk about the support from the global self, there is that, but Russia doesn't have a lot of support these days. So Putin has done enormous damage, obviously, to Ukraine. But he's obvious. He's also done terrible damage to Russia itself, um, and and we shouldn't, I, I think, wring our hands about what might come after Putin. We should focus on what the goal should be, and that is Ukrainian victory and Russian defeat. And whatever comes after uh, that is up to the Russians to sort out. So there is a question from Liz uh, Broker. A week ago, I returned to the United States from spending three months in Donbass. What do you believe are the best points I can make to Americans, congressional staff and members of Congress and any other doubters that Ukraine really isn't that far away, that we, the U.S., need to continue uninterrupted support as well as give even more? Uh, great question. I, I think... I. I kind of touched on this in the opening comments, but to me, it's Ukraine is is the front line of freedom. That if, if Russia is not stopped in Ukraine, then Russia and Putin will keep going on. And then we're talking about countries that are NATO members with Article 5 implications. And if we were not to respond in that case, then NATO is finished as, as an alliance, as the most successful military alliance in history. And, and so making sure that Putin is defeated in Ukraine serves our national interest and prevents this war from spreading. We, we've seen when people get worked up, when uh, a missile fell on Polish territory and killed two Poles, when fragments have fallen on R Romanian territory and questions being raised about what NATO's response to that would be. 
Uh, imagine if Putin were successful, and he's not going to be, but imagine if he were, uh, then he might keep marching on. And so uh, to me, that is that is the, the most, uh, uh, th that is the clearest answer to the question. But, but it's also just the moral right thing to do. For the reasons I cited about the true revolutions that Ukrainians have, have uh, launched from 2004 to 2014. And uh, these are, are good people, people who want to live in a democratic society. Uh, these aren't anti-Semites, despite the nonsense Kremlin propaganda. They've had a Jewish prime minister before. They have a Jewish president. Uh, they've been ranked as one of the least anti-Semitic countries in Europe, and uh, corruption has been a problem, but we see uh, the Ukrainian leadership taking a serious position on corruption, uh, dismissing the defense minister and the deputy ministers in that ministry, dismissing the recruiting officers. Um, Ukrainians' tolerance for corruption is is close to zero these days because the stakes are too high. So Ukraine has earned our support and we haven't talked about it, but I would argue they also have earned NATO membership. There is no NATO member who has the experience fighting the Russians and have shown a capability to do so successfully. And uh, I would hope that at next year's summit in Washington for NATO, that the Alliance moves ahead with an invitation to join. And I, it, I also hope the same with the Europeans. EU foreign ministers held a, <laughs> excuse me, a meeting in, in Kyiv uh, recently, and that was a demonstration of solidarity and support as well. David, uh, one thing about US policy, we've all been frustrated with, we've, the support has been great, but we're all been concerned that it's been slow and kind of behind the curve and we say, well, we'll give you these. We won't give you these, but then later say, okay, we'll give you those now, or we'll give you those sometime in the future. And then people say, let's not expand it or give them better weapons because it uh, might escalate the war. I don't understand that at all. We've got, we've got a lot of weapons that we have not provided to Ukraine. We have provided no aircraft. We have so many advanced technology weapons that we could provide Ukraine. And we, nobody quite understands why we've been so slow, why we keep holding them back. What do we think Putin's going to do? How, what does he have to do to convince people that he's evil? What, what is this thing about escalate? Uh, you know, nobody can quite understand the thinking at the White House, why we say, well, we got all these weapons, but sometime in the future, we might give them to them. Why is this kind of slow, just hand things out piecemeal to to Ukraine? What, why is that, why is that uh, get us to their goal of defeating Putin? So Morgan, and I think we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll just end with, with an answer on this. Um, I've never bought into the escalation concern um, uh, from the day this full-scale invasion was launched. How many red lines have the Russians drawn that if we provide assistance to Ukraine, if we provide high Mars, if we provide um, uh, uh, cluster munitions and other things, we will do X, Y, and Z. They never do X, Y, and Z. If there were attacks on Russian targets in Crimea, we will do X, Y, and Z. The Ukrainians have been hitting Russian targets in Crimea. The Ukrainians have been hitting targets inside Russian territory, and the Russians don't do it. Putin backs down in the face of strength, and that's what he needs to see. Obviously, he's seeing it every day from the Ukrainians, but he needs to see it from the United States and from other Europeans as well. And so uh, the, the nuclear threat, I think, has always been overblown. The Russians spout it because they hope it will get us to back off on providing assistance to Ukraine. We shouldn't fall for it. I don't think the Russian generals, frankly, would follow through on such an order if Putin were to give it. He would lose the support of the Chinese, the Indians, pretty much everybody in the global south if he were to do it. Moreover, I don't think it would change the, the, the situation on the, on the battlefield. 
the Ukrainians would keep fighting and a use of a tactical nuke might kill as many Ukrainians as uh, Russians as it would Ukrainians. Not that Putin cares about that. He treats Russian soldiers as cannon fodder anyway. So uh, I, I think the, the uh, nuclear escalation concern has been grossly overblown from day one. And the uh, last thing I'll say is, let's remember, last I checked, the United States is a pretty big military superpower in its own right. And uh, I think we have made clear that if Russia were to use a, a nuclear weapon, we would respond militarily. Um, that is exactly the message we should deliver. We shouldn't back down and we should continue to provide the support to, to Ukraine. So Morgan, thank you. Uh, thanks to your listeners for, for joining. Nadia, thank you. And uh, Slava Ukraina. David, thank you very much for your long support. Thank you for being in part of the leadership and uh, here to, to uh, fight for Ukraine and fight against Mr. Putin. And as we say at the Business Council, we need to throw Putin out. We need to get forward, move forward with Ukraine's advancement. And the business community is ready. And so we say, uh, uh, as we look ahead, full speed ahead. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you.